Joining me from San Francisco is Christian Whiten, former U.S. State Department senior advisor and deputy special envoy during the George W. Bush administration. He's the author of Smart Power Between Diplomacy and War. Let's get right to it. With the new wave of violence rocking Israel, what do you make of this, Christian? Well, it's a terrible development. I, you know, I think essentially it is a third intifada. You have uh, a debate over the use of that term, but you have so many people being killed. Uh, attacks that don't, uh, at least at first, or at least on their face value, seem to be directed by a central authority, but sort of spontaneous attacks, sort of like the types of ISIS attacks we see proliferating around the world. I don't think it's ISIS here, but um, it's taking a terrible toll. It's uh, people ha across Jerusalem and in other cities on edge. It requires a massive police presence. It's very disrupting to everyday life in Israel. I think it's great that Secretary Kerry is going to show some solidarity. Um, but in the past, of course, he's sort of been a bit morally equivalent between who's in the right and who's in the wrong. So I think it's important that he be very clear that the people who are doing this, the Islamists, if you will, uh, are to blame. Christian, this has been going on <laughs> seemingly forever. Uh, Bill Clinton told me once that he never thought anything was not solvable, but this might be something that is. Every secretary of state has faced it. What do we do? You know, I think the conventional wisdom is you have to solve this, the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, and that will make the other problems in the Middle East go away. That's something that, incidentally, is told to us by others in the Middle East who, frankly, would rather not address reform with or in their own countries. They tell us, you go solve Israel-Palestine, and then these other problems go away. I think the reverse is actually true. I think that the other problems, the other threats in the Middle East have to be managed before really any progress can be made. You've had a number of administrations, the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, at times the Obama administration want to mediate this. And of course, it goes back even further, even to the Carter administration, the thinking that there's some combination of words and inducements and agreement that can solve this. But as long as Iran has two proxy armies on Israel's borders, Hamas in the south, Hezbollah in the north, and you have Islamism really on fire, political Islam on fire on the Middle East, I just don't see how you can resolve this. So the best that you can hope for really um, is, to, is to work on security, defensive measures against terrorist attacks like this. Christian, you watched the Democratic debate. Did foreign policy get enough attention? It didn't. You know, two words that weren't mentioned were radical Islam. I'm not in favor of beating up on Muslims. We need Muslims on our side because we need to activate people who have a voice in the debate within Islam uh, in order to turn on the Islamists. The same way in the Cold War, we didn't send capitalists to preach markets and capitalism to communists. We found socialists and social democrats, people with a voice in the debate, to argue against the communists and won the battle of ideas that way. Last night, we didn't hear any talk about radical Islam or any of the ideology that motivates ISIS or al-Qaeda or these terrorists uh, who are uh, killing Israelis or the Iranian regime. There's a common thread there. It's Islamism. It's not mentioned. Jim Webb tried something. He tried mentioning the biggest uh, geopolitical threat to the United States, which he says is China. I actually believe that. As far as a nation state that can kill us, it really is China more so than Iran or Russia. But really, it was uh, crickets after he said that. So not a lot of serious discussion. On Syria, Hillary Clinton supports an American-led no-fly zone to stabilize it. You think that'll work? It's a terrible idea, whether it's coming from Hillary Clinton or Republicans like John McCain. You know, a no-fly zone is really going to war without a candid discussion and debate and vote on who you want to win, who you want to lose. Um, you know, the problems with the no-fly zone today are the same as they were when this war started uh, three or so years ago. It doesn't necessarily help the people you want to help. I mean, it probably would be detrimental to ISIS, uh, but uh, it could be detrimental to Assad. So it's really a way of sort of starting American commitment with without a strategy. Um, you know, to the extent there are moderates left in Syria, perhaps they can be supported. Perhaps the tribes in Iraq and in the, in, in, in the Sunni parts of Iraq could expand but uh, into, into Syria as part of a solution. But really, I don't think anyone or I think very few people want to start dropping bombs on Syria before we have uh, a discussion of what comes next and who's going to win. Senator Sanders thinks we shouldn't even be involved. Do you? Unfortunately, I think we have to be to some extent. Um, you know, these threats just don't ha improve without American presence. Uh, people like Donald Trump can imagine that uh, Vladimir Putin can solve our problems. Um, but, of course, as we, as we all now well know, he's not 
really targeting ISIS. He's targeting the opponents of the Assad regime. You know, I, I think Syria resembles, quite frankly, the, the Spanish Civil War back in the late 1930s, where both sides, uh, frankly, look pretty unpalatable. But, um, you know, what's happening there is spilling into Europe. You have a million, two million refugees that will affect us here. And when you have these wildfires around the Middle East burning out of control, I mean, the idea of ISIS attacking people in the United States is not just a theory. Over the 4th of July, the FBI said it thwarted dozens of attacks, potentially coast to coast. So we've, get, we've, we've you know, taken precautions and been lucky, but these problems do come to our doorstep. Senator Sanders said that the greatest threat to American security is climate change. You did an op-ed piece. You said that was ludicrous. Why? You know, uh, first on just the issue of climate change, I think it's something that we ought to be concerned about, but the science is is, is not quite as settled as uh, the Democrats would have you believe. We've come, we're in the middle or at the end, or perhaps in the middle of a period that's lasted about 18 years where uh, Earth's temperatures, at least as measured by satellites, um, have not risen. And this is at a time when all of the models by the um, uh, climate uh, change aficionados, if you will, have sh shown that Earth's temperature should have risen dramatically. So this is a question about the science, but also, you know, as America is losing around the world to Russia, Putin has eaten our lunch twice in Syria, first with the chemical weapons agreement and now with uh, slipping a basin under our nose. We appear to be losing to China uh, in the realm of cybersecurity and in the South China Sea, ISIS. We've been at war with ISIS, the United States of America, the most powerful military in the world, and we have made virtually no progress over the course of a year, a year and a half, um, and Iran seemingly prevailing at the negotiating table. So while all this is going on, it just seems unrealistic to say climate change is the biggest threat. And also, it's, it's the American people are not in quite the uh, proto-isolationist mood they were in 2008, where they were incredibly wary of the wars. They're still wary of wars, but they are concerned about ISIS and other threats. And sort of to say, well, let's just worry about uh, uh, air temperature and ocean volume, that's, that seems off the point. All the Republican candidates said they would cancel the Iran nuclear deal. You agree with that? I do. Um, I think it's important to have uh, something as a replacement. I, I think it's important to, you know, signal that we're going to coordinate with, with allies. And, you know, Iran, the nuclear threat, of course, is the most urgent. It's a threat to Israel. And it's also a threat to the United States with their expanding ballistic missile capabilities. But I think, uh, without mentioning the words no one wants to talk about, which is regime change, that we need to start some sort of discussion in our own country and planning for how you help uh, dissidents inside Iran. You're never going to get security in the Middle East uh, or in that part uh, in the Gulf until that regime is different than it is now, whether it's the elevation of real reformers or whether it's the replacement of this Islamist tyranny with something more secular. Uh, we saw these people take to the streets in 2009 and 2010. They weren't shouting death to America. They weren't seeking Islamism. They weren't siding with uh, ISIS or what would become ISIS. They were, wanted modernity. They wanted secular government. They were young, modern Iranians. Uh, and, and getting behind them and influencing the future uh, outcome of Iran, I think is, is important if you also talk about ending the nuclear deal. Looking at all the candidates and with your experience, Democrat, Republican, which one stands out to you? Uh, you know, on the on the Democratic side, I, I, I do like Jim Webb. I think he has almost no chance, of course. And last night, he didn't do terribly well complaining about the rules, which he agreed to in advance. Uh, it's hard not to like Bernie Sanders on some level. He's very candid. I just, uh, you know, think that um, he, he is, is, is rather far left. In the Republican Party, uh, I supported Scott Walker early on. That went nowhere. I supported him because I think you don't only need better policies in national security. You need to take on these entrenched establishments in Washington. You know, reformers like Carly Fiorina or uh, conservatives Ted Cruz, I'm, I'm sort of undecided, but I think those candidates are more serious than the frontrunner Donald Trump. When you worked for George Bush, are you disappointed with Jeb? You know, I I, uh, I am. Um, I was of I was curious who was going to show up. Is it Jeb, the conservative reformer, Southern governor, or is it the scion of the Bush family, uh, the latest edition of, of the House of Bush, of, if you will? And I think we've gotten the latter. If you look at the foreign policy advisors he selected early on um, and 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 boasted of, frankly, uh, some of them are good. I know a number of them, but some of them are not good. You had James Baker out lecturing J Street, sort of siding against Israel. 
Um, you have Hank Paulson, and uh, at least not in name, although probably in spirit, but Bob Zelik in name, um, on China, who was very partial to China, was very partial to Beijing um, when he was Deputy Secretary of State and President of the World Bank. You have a lot of Wall Street names. Uh, so the idea that this would be materially different than the downside of, uh, of W's foreign policy, I think, is a hard sell. Christian, thanks so much. Terrific guest. Thank you, Larry.